On this week's Vaticano, Pope Francis stops in to the Polish parish in the heart of Rome for Mass. He also tells us to read the Bible and receive communion often, especially when we're sad. The Vatican's new commission for the protection of minors meets for the first time. The Papal Foundation continues to support the Pope in his charity. Also, we speak to locals who knew Saints John Paul II and John XXIII and discover John Paul II's Institute for Studies on Marriage and the Family in Rome. We take you inside the recently opened pontifical villas at Castel Gandolfo and an art exhibit on the church's newly recognized saints. All this next on Vaticano. Just a few days after the canonizations, Pope Francis celebrated a Thanksgiving Mass at the Church of St. Stanislaus in Rome. St. John Paul II came here over 80 times to pray. È sempre venuto qui. He always came here, during different moments of his life and of Poland, in times of sadness and dejection, when all seemed lost. He did not lose hope, because his faith and his hope focused on God. And because of that, he was a stone, a rock for his community, which prays here, which listens to God's word here. This church administers and prepares them for the sacraments, welcomes who is in need, it sings and it parties, and this spreads from here to the outskirts of Rome. You, brothers and sisters, form part of a people that has been very tested throughout history. The Polish people knows well that to enter into glory it is necessary to pass through the Passion and the Cross. And it knows this not because it has studied it, it knows it because it has experienced it. St. John Paul II, as a worthy son of his fatherland, has followed this path. He has followed it in an exemplary way, receiving a total dispossession from God. For this reason, his flesh rests in hope. What about us? Are we willing to follow this path? You, dear brothers, who form today's Christian Polish community of Rome, do you want to follow this path? That same day, Sunday, May 4, Pope Francis also prayed the Regina Celli prayer instead of the Angelus, since the church is still around Easter time. Thousands gathered at St. Peter's Square to hear his teaching. La strada di Emmaus diventa così the road to Emmaus becomes a symbol of our journey of faith. Scripture and the Eucharist are the essential elements for the encounter with the Lord. We too arrive often to Sunday Mass with our worries, our difficulties and disillusions. Sometimes life hurts us and being sad, we go to our Emmaus, turning our back on God's plan. We move away from God, but the liturgy of the Word welcomes us. Jesus explains the scriptures to us and He rekindles the warmth of faith and hope in our hearts and gives us strength in communion. God's Word, the Eucharist. Read a passage from the Gospel every day. Remember it well. Read a passage from the Gospel every day and on Sundays go to communion to receive Jesus. This is what happened with the disciples of Emmaus. They received the Word, they shared the breaking of the bread and changed from feeling sadness and defeated to feeling joy. Dear brothers and sisters, the Word of God and the Eucharist always fills us with joy. Remember it well. When you are sad, read the Word of God. When you're feeling down, read the Word of God and go to Sunday Mass to receive communion, to participate in the mystery of Jesus. The Word of God and the Eucharist fill us with joy. The Vatican's new commission for the protection of minors has met for the first time. To speak about the direction this new commission will take. My biggest hope uh, in the work of this commission is that we can really um, continue to be aware of the necessity within the church to deal with the issue of the abuse that has happened and, um, and to do whatever the church institutions and the church as such can do in terms of uh, prevention work so that um, abuse uh, is constantly a concern for, for bishops, um, for religious, for all Catholic institutions and, and we do 
with all our resources um, to make the wor world and the church a safer place for, uh, for children. And we're going to be um, trying to understand the processes which are in place at the moment um, and considering whether they can be made stronger and how they can be made stronger so that we can advise the, the appropriate the Castries and the Pope. Our, our advice is directly to the Holy Father. I think uh, the point is that the, the Pope makes it a priority within the Catholic Church and we, we continue with this. So it's uh, a mid-term and long-term uh, process and I think the, all Catholics can be um, sure that we will continue with the work. We request the prayers because this is certainly something we, we need um, in a field that is very difficult. Um, as all of us know, um, but where we can also do much um, as a church uh, and um, as followers of Christ. The Commission has its mission, but it doesn't have its statutes yet. It will draft them within the next few months. So far it's agreed that it will not be treating individual sex abuse cases, but rather offering recommendations of best practices and policies within and outside of the Vatican. The first international life forum took place here in Rome at the start of the month. Pro-life leaders from across the world came to support the Italians as well as the church. Today we had a meeting of uh, pro-life leaders from around the world uh, and we had a, a behind the doors uh, meeting this morning and it was really to strategize together and also to collaborate and cooperate together. There are many different organizations uh, working uh, for pro -life, the pro-life cause in different fields so to bring the different leaders together is a very important task and I think to get people communicating together to collaborate where they can collaborate and um, to realize common goals and objectives is a very very important task. Um, 40 days for Life is specifically encouraging Christians to uh, campaign together to pray for an end to abortion. That is our specific role, but whether, where it is possible to unite and collaborate with, with other organizations, it's really important and good to do that. The following day, May 4th, they took the streets for Italy's fourth annual March for Life. Participants included women conceived in rape, who say no compromises can be made when protecting life. As soon as you say that children conceived in rape can be compromised, you've, you've basically negated your whole position that life is precious. And whenever I hear the motto in the pro-life movement of save the 99 for the one, I always think of the parable of the lost sheep where Jesus was talking about the little children and he made the one a priority. He spoke quite a bit about the least of these. And who are the least of these in today's society? Is it not all the hard cases, children conceived in rape and children with special needs? I hope the world understands that just because your conception might have happened from something bad, or in my case, my mother is schizophrenic, that just because she's mentally ill doesn't mean that my life doesn't have value and that I can't be productive and, and be a voice. Some people are very negative and have negative things to say about our stance and the fact that we're open. But when we hear that babies' lives are saved, it means the world. About 200 members of the Papal Foundation made their annual visit to Rome. They attended a mass celebrated by the Archbishop of Washington, Cardinal Donald Wuerl, at the Basilicas of St. John Lateran and St. Peter in Chains. But Francis received them on May 2nd. I have to say this pilgrimage has been very moving because Pope Francis has re-energized us all, not just the church, but I think the world as a whole. And I think the fact that he makes all of us uncomfortable by challenging all of us, secular, Christian, of all faiths. You know, he's, he's asking us all to open our hearts and asking us questions that we may have become really, we'd fallen asleep in some ways. And he's waking us all up and I love that. And it, there's an energy here in Rome and the lines and just, it, it's, it's palpable. And that I, is a dramatic and really exciting difference. The new evangelization is palpable. Well, who better to give than somebody with the most generous giving heart, you know? Mm -hmm. we, we would give money and we'd be like, well, you know, do they really need that? But he, I yeah. mean, he has so much love that you know that wherever he gives the money from this foundation is the greatest and most important place to give, you know? And I feel confident that he's going to do that 
with great love and charity. So. As we know, there's so many charities that are worthwhile and uh, you do, in the end, have to choose. And, but I, I feel that I cannot really know all the good projects that the Catholic Church would be involved in. And um, I just felt led. I had thought about the Papal Foundation for a couple of years, but really it was right after Pope Francis was elected that I just really felt God's little nudge um, and feeling like this was the right time. I just um, was so happy thinking that Pope Francis would be directing the funds to the missions that he feels are the most worthy and, and that need it the most. Um, so it just, just seemed right. The Papal Foundation supports hundreds of projects worldwide, including in the Vatican, every year. They have donated a total of over $100 million to the Pope's charities. Stay with us after the break. We'll be back with stories from people who knew the church's newly recognized Pope Saints. Thanks for watching. This is Vaticano. Thousands of pilgrims gathered at St. Peter's Square to hear his weekly teaching on May 7. This time he spoke about one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of counsel. Today we consider the gift of counsel. This is the gift with which the Holy Spirit helps us to make decisions in our concrete lives, following the logic of Jesus and His Gospel. It illuminates our heart and makes us more sensitive to the voice of the Spirit so that we do not get carried away in our thoughts, feelings and intentions by selfishness or our own way of looking at things, but by the will of God. At the same time, it leads us to conform more and more to Jesus as a model of our actions and our relation with God and with our brothers. What can we do to be more docile to the gift of counsel? The essential condition is prayer. Thanks to the intimacy with God, and to the hearing of His Word, a profound harmony with God matures in us and leads us to ask ourselves constantly, what is it that the Lord desires? What is His will? What is it that pleases Him? On the other hand, the gift of counsel, as the other gifts, also constitutes a treasure for the whole Christian community. God speaks to us only in the intimacy of our heart, but also sometimes from the voice and testimony of the faith of our brothers, who help us to see more clearly and recognize the will of God. Castle Gandolfo, the historic summer residence of the popes. Saints John XXIII and John Paul II both spent time here. This retired farmer met Saint John XXIII during the town's yearly peach festival. His life was changed forever. The Pope started to look at me in a curious way, and I got embarrassed. And he asked me, so, who are you? And I answered, the president of the Farmers Guild of Castel Gandolfo. So I've also been a farmer. I come from a family of farmers. And then he asked me, and how old are you? I was 40 years old. I understood why he was observing me, because he saw I wasn't wearing a wedding ring. You know, at your age, you should either get married or end religious life. Those words impacted me. In those days, people my age wouldn't get married anymore. And thanks to his push, I met my wife and a few years later, I proposed to her and we got married. I can tell you that I have had an exemplary family. Because of my wife as well as my children, there are ten of us, seven women and three men, all very generous. And I'm very proud. Between St. John Paul II and John XXIII, everyone in town seems to have a story. The first time I met John Paul II was in 1981, and it was very beautiful because it was on the occasion of the Peach Festival, which is done traditionally in this city. I was executive counselor for tourism 
and we organized the Peach Festival. And we went with many children, so it was a big group of locals, as it is every year when the Pope receives us. It was very impressive because he grabbed my arm strongly and said, have strength, courage, keep going. I can tell you about John XXIII that his evening escapes were famous. My dad would tell me how every now and then he would escape and the police and security were forced to drop what they were doing even many times when they were eating because the chief police would come get them to search for John XXIII who had gone out on his own. He would go out in the evenings without telling anything to anyone. Regarding John Paul II, whose entire papacy, thank goodness, I've lived through, I can say that he was a person... There are no words. He was much more than a saint, because the emotions I felt when I encountered him several times was something unique. John Paul II was a saint, indescribable. I remember one time when we were alone in a room with him. It was me, my wife, the parish priest and my little son. And they left us alone with him. In the next room there were around 50 bishops and they were waiting for him to be brought in because he wasn't able to walk anymore. And at a certain point we didn't know what to do, to go forward or to go backwards. There was absolutely nobody there with us, not even his secretary. It was just us and the Pope. So we, very delicately, walking slowly and backwards, started to leave. And he, with his voice, said, goodbye. When I tell this, the hair on my arms always goes up because it's beautiful. This is Rome's Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and the Family. It's preparing priests, religious, and laity to assist bishops around the world in the pastoral care of the family. St. John Paul II created the institute 30 years ago to address a need. John Paul II did not want for there to be a focus only on the problems, but rather on an overall positive vision of the mystery of the family, this mystery that concerns all of us, which is the mystery in which we are born into as men and women, this original duality that allows us to rediscover our own identity. John Paul II wanted this institute precisely to offer the Church a thinking that is a new and positive wellspring concerning the family. The first aspect that he highlighted within his vision on marriage and the family was a vision of approaching a big mystery of man and woman, which in their experience of their encounter manifests a bit of the mystery of God, and at the same time they manifest the mystery of man. Mystery of God and mystery of man meet each other in marriage and in the family. I came to study John Paul II and to get to know him, know his writings um, in a general way, meaning I, I came to uh, read The Theology of the Body, one of his main works, uh, which is a collection of catechesis, the Wednesday catechesis, and at the center is the, um, the beauty of um, the love between man and woman and the uh, the dignity of the body as being always a personal body and not something to be objectified but being uh, uh, part of who we are and part of, um, of, of our vocation to love and to accept love, to, to welcome love. Uh, so for me that was a, an eye-opener. I mean it was a, something that um, really change the, 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 view, uh, the view on sexuality because we hear so much about how sexuality is something to, just to enjoy and just to use, but not related to, to love. So how sexuality can really be uh, an expression of, of, of who we are and it's something important. It's not just a game and entertainment, but it's really something that touches our hearts and, um, and creates a, a bond, a true bond with the other. I spent four years at the John Paul II Institute um, studying marriage and family and uh, basically we looked at marriage and family through the lenses of scripture, theology, philosophy, sociology, psychology, and anthropology. 
um, which really gave us a well-rounded formation to come back and really like bring the gospel of the family to the faithful, um, but also to help to heal some of the wounds that people have because of the difficulties of family life. If there's something we need his intercession for today, we need his intercession for strong families and for the building up of communion within the family. Because even Pope Benedict said that the new evangelization is inseparable from family life. And today as we're trying to reach, um, reach people who have uh, been away from the church, um, reaching them through the family is really key to fostering that relationship with Christ and, um, and really bringing people the gospel. Stick around after a brief pause. We'll show you around the pontifical villas of Casa Gandolfo and a new exhibit from this young Polish artist. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. The Vatican has opened the Pope's summer villas to the public for the first time in history. Thanks to Pope Francis, who gave the order, and the help of the Vatican museums, we were allowed to take a peek inside. I really like this visit because it's been open to the public for a month, and I've been living in Italy for 25 years. So it's something I've never seen before, and I've never had this opportunity. So I'm here today because I had this chance. It's been fascinating. The incredible thing was walking in the same places where the popes have walked throughout the centuries. So it's been something a bit out of this world. You think you're really in another world. You think outside there is a gate and beyond it there is ordinary life. But here it really seems like you're in a sort of paradise. Something incredible. A typical work day includes many things like the farm, the palace and the gardens. The day never ends. Like all tourists, they are enthusiastic and become fascinated because unless you see them, you can't imagine the beauty of these gardens. The message that I would want to give to people by this cycle is to show uh, the human, the normal faces of these great two saint personalities. Uh, they were not only the popes, but they were the personifications of God's love, uh, God's goodness, and uh, the joy, the carita. Uh, and their beautiful quotes are still very valid to modern society, not only to the Christian people, but they send a message of hope, peace, uh, uh, the need of uh, forgiveness and dialogue between different cultures, different religions, and also they underline the meaning of, uh, of suffering. That suffering isn't without any meaning, that it's, we can also get a lot of strength from suffering, which mostly they were um, the examples, as we can see, uh, the death of John 23rd before he suffered, also the, his, uh, his Holiness John Paul II, uh, most of his pontificate was, uh, was an example of how uh, suffering has meaning. And that is also a message that I would like to give to all. Ten portraits each of John Paul II and John XXIII are being exhibited across Rome, some of them outside the main churches like St. John Lateran, St. Mary Major and St. Paul's outside the walls. The artist Anna Gulak, a young Pole, sculptor and painter. At first I was inspired by the personality of the great uh, Pope John Paul II when I was asked to do a papal medal after my first year of studies uh, for him and uh, it was commissioned by the Vatican and I studied a lot of pictures of his face. I was inspired by his face because for me he was not only um, a religious leader, a great saint, uh, a great pope, but he was uh, a modern man of great charisma. He was a modern Peter of our times. He was a great, great leader, philosopher, uh, but he was also emphatic, he, a simple man. Uh, so I wanted to show all, this, all these, his qualities to other people, that he was not only, as I said, a religious uh, leader, but he was 
uh, he represented the fullness of uh, Christian humanism for me. And then uh, after the news uh, that they will be, be uh, that the canonized together, I decided to uh, to fulfill the cycle with uh, mm, portraying the faces of Jan 23rd because they had a lot of uh, similar qualities, as gentle as goodness, uh, uh, they talked a lot about peace. In fact, her drawings of St. John Paul II had already been completed a few years ago. It was just a few months ago that she began those of John XXIII. It was, a, as I am a believing person, it was a, a great blessing that I could be here in Rome during the canonizations. And, uh, is you could feel the, um, the greatness of the moment. It was a, a wonderful and happy day. And uh, I'm very happy because for me, he was, as for many thousands and millions, he was uh, holy, as was uh, John, Paul the 23rd, John 23rd uh, during uh, their life. But right now, when the Catholic Church uh, made it official, it was, uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great thing, as one might say.